If you have a Bible this morning, if you would turn to the book of Hebrews, uh, we are going to look at Hebrews chapter 3 this morning. Uh, if, you, if you haven't been with us or perhaps you have just, you've had a busy week and you've forgotten where we are in our study, uh, we are in the sort of the beginning stages of a study of the book of Hebrews that we have called uh, Holding Fast to a Better Hope. And so far in our study, we have uh, begun to think that uh, as the, the writer of Hebrews tells us and tells the, the church that this letter was written to, which was a, a small church of Jewish background believers that were beginning to feel the pinch of the world coming in around them and trying to pressure them to give up the gospel, to water down the gospel, to, to look other ways, or perhaps even some of them were just kind of sitting on the side going, you know what, I kind of give, I give up. This letter was written to encourage them to not give up and to look to Jesus because Jesus is better. And we saw in chapter one where the writer of Hebrews says, Jesus is better than the angels. He's better than the angels because Jesus is God. Jesus is the one who sits on God's throne and receives the worship of the angels. He is God who controls the cosmos. But also Jesus, we saw in chapter two, Jesus is man. He's fully God and fully man. And the writer of Hebrews says to us last week, he had to become man so that he could become a propitiation for our sin. That's a big word that simply means he took the wrath of God that was deserved for us. He had to be man so that he could stand in our place and that his righteousness, his perfection is now ours. And the wrath that was due to us was given to him. And so now he's going to continue in this train of thought of the fact that Jesus is better and to hold fast. So let's read chapter three of the book of Hebrews. Uh, Therefore, holy brothers, you who share in a heavenly calling, consider Jesus the author, uh, the apostle and high priest of our confession, who was faithful to him, who appointed him, just as Moses also was faithful in all God's house. For Jesus has been counted more worthy of more glory than Moses, as much more glory as the builder of a house has more honor than the house itself. For every house is built by someone, but the builder of all things is God." Now Moses was faithful in all God's house as a servant to testify to the things that were to be spoken later. But Christ is faithful over God's house as a son. And we are his house if indeed we hold fast our confidence and our boasting in our hope. Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. On the day of testing in the wilderness, where your fathers put me to the test and saw my works for 40 years. Therefore, I was provoked with that generation and said, they always go astray in their heart. They have not known my ways. As I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God. But exhort one another every day, as long as it's called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we have come to share in Christ if indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end. As it is said, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. For who were those who heard and yet rebelled? Was it not all those who left Egypt led by Moses? And with whom was he provoked for 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who were disobedient? So we see that they were unable to enter because of unbelief. God's word for us this morning. Would you pray together with me? Heavenly Father, we pray that as we come now to your word, that once again you might send your spirit to come and to to help us to understand Lord, help us to lay aside the distractions of this world, of of our week behind or the week ahead, and to focus while it is called today on Jesus, to be encouraged in him and to see that he indeed 
and in fact is better. And so, Lord, through your spirit, would you help us to understand and apply your word for us this morning? In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Ryan, I don't know if this isn't part of the sermon, by the way. I, I'm, I'm really having trouble with a lot of feedback up here. And so I hear myself like four times. It was great the first two times I said it. Um, <laughs> But I only want to hear it twice. Um, so if there's anything that we can do, that would be awesome. I don't know if you guys can hear it. Uh, that's great. If they can't hear it, then don't worry about it. I'll press on. Um, but anyway, I was a, a wee bit distracted right there. So we have this morning, I want to think about a, oh, that's much better. Thank you. Woo. We have an awesome team up there, guys, um, and we are so grateful for you. Ryan, thank you, and everybody that's up in the booth that I can't see uh, because the lights are bright. This morning, I want us to think about uh, an acronym, an acronym that's become popular in the last 10 years or so, maybe longer, and I just never knew it. Uh, the acronym is the GOAT. The GOAT stands for, if you're unfamiliar with the GOAT, the GOAT stands for the greatest of all time. And some people um, have gone so far as to, on their, and particularly in the sports arena, they have gone to wear a picture of a goat on their uniforms. Because it, it's Simone Biles, the gymnast. She's the goat. She is the greatest gymnast of all time that we, that we know of. And she wears a goat on her leotard. And I'm like, I told my daughter, I was like, Caitlin, what does she wear? It's a goat. She's the greatest of all time. I'm like, yeah, she, okay. There's, there's debates that go on all over television. It's, why they, it's how they fill 15 different sports channels with debates all day of who's the goat? Is Tom Brady the greatest of all time? Was Peyton Manning the greatest of all time? Was so-and-so the greatest of all time? And you have all kinds of arguments of who's the greatest quarterback of all time? Who's the greatest gymnast of all time? Who's the greatest actor or actress? Who's the greatest, is Warren Buffett the greatest investor of all time? Was Steve Jobs the greatest investor inventor of all times. I think the inventor of air conditioning was the greatest inventor of all times, but that's just because I'm new to Florida. Um, the, the goat, that conversation, why do we have that? Why do we go about putting thought and effort into who's the goat? Because it's somebody or something that we want to look up to. It's something that we want to measure everyone else against. When you come to the NFL draft, what does ESPN do? With every quarterback, they put a comparison between what Tom Brady was like in college and what that quarterback has done in college. What that investor has done up to that age and what Warren Buffett has done up to that age. And everyone who we, we kind of put up onto this pedestal. And we also not just compare and contrast, but when we want to teach the next generation something, you teach them what the goat has done. When you wanna teach someone how to play golf, you don't get videos of Charles Barkley. Some of you get that, some of you don't. If you don't, just YouTube right after you register for VBS, Charles Barkley Golf, and you will understand. What do you do? You show them Tiger Woods in his prime. You show them the greatest of all time. The writer of Hebrews is going to move in his argument from Jesus was fully God in chapter 1, he's fully man in chapter 2, and now he's going to take those two things and he's going to go at the heart of what this church was struggling with and, and believed in some ways because they saw Moses as the goat. Moses was the greatest man of all time. And so he is going to compare Jesus with Moses. Because like the angels in chapter 1, the people that were coming into this church and trying to pressure them were trying to say, well, just say that he's, he's like Moses. 
Moses was the goat. He was the greatest. Just say that he was like Moses in some ways, or he was equal to Moses in some ways, because they held Moses at such a high level and a high standard. And they would have said, actually, let's learn how to live the life following God. Look at Moses. Emulate him. Be like Moses. And so what the writer of Hebrews is going to do is he's going to take Jesus and compare him with Moses. And then in the second half of chapter 3, he's going to say, let's think about the followers of Moses and the followers of Jesus. So that's our two points this morning. Jesus and Moses, Moses' followers, Jesus' followers. And let's see where that will take us. So the writer, as, as I mentioned earlier, to, to the people that heard this, chapters one through three, this is a natural logical progression in their kind of train of thought. This just comes kind of normally. And so he, he starts off and he says, therefore, holy brothers, you who share in a heavenly calling, consider Jesus, the apostle and high priest of our confession, who was faithful to him who appointed him, just as Moses was faithful in all God's house. For Jesus has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses. So the question that we have to start off with is why did they consider Moses the goat? Why was Moses the greatest person of all time? Moses, if you're not familiar with Old Testament history, Moses actually got to do some really amazing stuff. Moses was born and he should have, along with lots of the other boys there in Egypt, who were slaves, like all of the other boys his age, they were killed. Moses' mom put him in a basket, sent him down the river. Pharaoh's daughter finds him and goes, oh, wow, look, it's one of the Hebrew children. And then she gives him back to his mother to, to wean him. And then Moses grows up in Pharaoh's house. And then Moses is being prepared by God. He goes off, he, he wanders in the wilderness for a while, and then he comes back. And he says, I'm, I'm here to lead. I'm here to lead the Israelites out of slavery into the promised land. And so Moses does incredible things. He had an incredible upbringing. If you had, if, just put your finger there in, in Hebrews chapter 3 and flip back real quick to Numbers chapter 12. Numbers chapter 12 is, is one of the verses that, that the, the Jewish folks went to to kind of hang their hat on why Moses was so great, not just because of his upbringing, because of what God did. In verse 6 of Numbers 12, God says, Hear my words. If there is a prophet among you, I, the Lord, make myself known to him in a vision. I speak with him in a dream, not so with my servant Moses. He is faithful in all my house. With him I speak mouth to mouth, clearly, and not in riddles, and he beholds the form of the Lord. To the prophets, how did I speak? Dreams, visions, riddles, they didn't quite understand it, but I gave it. Moses, how did I speak? Moses, come here, let's face to face. Moses be beholds the glory of God. He goes up into the cloud and he comes down. We've mentioned this before. He comes down off the mountain and the people are like, ooh, could you put a bag on your head? Because you are glowing because you've been in the presence of the glory of God. Moses, in the, in the human sense, but through the spirit, Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible. He wrote the law. He gave them the law. We know it comes from God, but it comes through Moses. So that's why Moses is held in such high regard. Because no one else spoke with God mouth to mouth, face to face. Nobody else wrote the first five books of the Bible. Moses was highly important. And yet the writer of Hebrews says, as good as Moses was, Jesus is better. Jesus is better even than Moses. Moses wasn't perfect, but the writer of Hebrews never goes that route to try to destroy him with all of his faults. 
Moses, the second time the people are, they're walking around in the wilderness. They walked around in the wilderness for a long time and they started whining about not having enough water. And the second time that happened, Moses gets infuriated with the people and he takes a staff and he strikes the rock twice and water gushes out. And God goes, Moses, what are you doing? Why did you take my glory? Why did you do that without me? You've sinned against me. And because of that, you're actually not gonna be able to enter the promised land. I'm gonna let you see it. I'm gonna take you up on a mountain called Mount Pisgah so that you can look and see, but you're actually not gonna go. Now, if it was me and I was trying to prove that Jesus was better than some other guy, that's where I would go. I'd go right there like, yeah, you look, see, he messed up, he messed up bad, he sinned. And so don't be like, don't be like Moses because Moses sinned. The writer of Hebrews says Moses was faithful. Moses was faithful in all of God's house, but Jesus is better. Verse one, Jesus is the apostle and high priest of our confession. That's the only time in all of scripture that Jesus is referred to as an apostle. The word apostle simply means sent one. He was one who was sent out. He was sent out by God. He was sent from heaven to earth to be one of us, to take the curse for us. Moses was a sent one, but Moses wasn't a high priest. Moses did not take the, the punishment that Jesus did. And so he says, look, Jesus is better than Moses. Here, that, here are two titles. Jesus is an apostle and he is a high priest. And here is what Moses did. He, he built the house. He built the house. But the one who gets the glory is the one who created the house. We think about that if you think about, uh, to me, I've been wrestling with this all week. Like, what, that doesn't make sense. Like, I discovered a new neighborhood just down kind of the other side of uh, Lake Howell High School from where we live around. And I, I was riding my bike down one night and I went and was like, oh my. Like, why do they need a seven car garage? Like this looks like, and I took one of my daughters down there um, and she was like, this looks like a hotel. I was like, that's a single family home. And I was like, the, the house is glorious. And the writer of Hebrews says, actually what's more glorious is the one who built it. The one who designed it. The one who made it possible. We do that with houses that with, like you see a house like, oh, that's a Frank Lloyd Wright. Ah, now you see, you go to St. Paul's Cathedral in London. Sir Christopher Wren designed the place because the building actually points to the designer. And that's what the writer of Hebrews wants us to see is that Moses, he did all these great things, but he was actually a pointer to Jesus. And he says that explicitly in verse five. Now Moses was faithful in all God's house as a servant. That word servant is not the word for slave that's usually used throughout the, the New Testament. That is the, the highest ranking place in a home outside of the family. And so he's giving Moses great glory in that word. He's saying Moses was faithful in all God's house as a servant to testify to the things that were to be spoken later. Those things that were to be spoken later are Jesus. And so here's what he's saying. Moses, he was, he was good. There's no, you know, he, did he sin? Yes. But he did lots of great things. He was a servant in the house. And what was his job? To point to Jesus. To say, here is the one who is coming. And then he says something absolutely remarkable in verse 6. And we are that house. We're the house that Jesus is building. We are the ones that Jesus has brought into his kingdom. And the writer of Hebrews wants to remind us of that. And it's almost like he's doing that in such a subtle way. He said, hey, you, you're, you're wanting to give up. You're wanting to deny. You're wanting to water Jesus down. No, don't. Jesus 
He, he's not like Moses. He's an apostle. He's the high priest. He's God. He's man. He took our, the wrath of God so that we could be made into the house of God. And that's who we are as followers of him. But I want to ask the question that maybe you have in your mind or maybe you've had it for the last 10 minutes as I'm going through explaining that. And the question is, so what, pastor? So what? So what does that mean for us? What does it mean that Jesus was better than Moses? What would it have meant for them? I think the so what, what I said a few minutes ago was that what he is doing, what the writer of Hebrews is doing is he's beginning to go deeper. He's going deeper and taking these truths of Jesus is God and Jesus is man and he's taking them and it's almost like he's, he's sticking his finger down deep into us with this truth. And he says, you actually, you, you, wanna, you wanna emulate Moses. You want to be like Moses. You want to elevate Moses up to this place, and you want to follow him. But all he actually was and is is a pointer to Jesus. You, you think we ought to be like Moses. The Bible rarely says, be like anybody in the Bible. The Bible rarely, if ever, says, be like Moses. It doesn't say, be like David, be like Solomon. It, it's often the easy way for us, I think. It's, it's what, what my heart so many times just wants to preach to myself and to you, to just say, stop it. You have a giant in front of you. Well, be like David. Take out your five smooth stones and slay your giants. Let's close in prayer. But he, what he's doing is he's beginning to say and beginning to make this long argument that he's going to make throughout this book that we actually live by faith. We live by faith in Jesus. We live by faith in his work and what he has done. And so he says in, in verse one of this chapter, you who share in a heavenly calling as the household of God, consider Jesus. That word consider, it's not like, um, you know, if someone were to ask you before you got to church today, like you're driving in the car here and they ask you this question, where should we go to lunch afterwards? So while you're sitting here and while we're singing and while we're doing announcements and while I'm preaching, you are considering different places. Do we want to go to, you know, a, a fast food? Do we want to go to American? Do we want to go to Mexican food? Do we want Chinese food? Do we want to, and you're considering those things. You're just, that's not what he's talking about. When he says the word consider, he says consider means take everything about Jesus and bring it in. Consider it. Pull all the argument from chapters one and two and soak it into every corner of who you are. Consider Jesus. Don't just go, well, I like that, I don't like that. No, consider everything about him and take it to everything about you. And so he says, don't, don't try to emulate Moses. Consider Jesus for us, often it's time, often it's easier for us to copy than to believe because it puts the responsibility on us. And Hebrews and all of scripture comes along and says, it's not about copying the goat. It's about believing in the one who was the greatest. It's believing in the one who laid down his life for us. And now he's going to go, not just with this finger kind of pointing and into us and digging into us a little bit. And now he's going to, as he digs into us, he's going to twist it and he's going to make it hurt in some ways when he goes to the second half of this chapter. And he says, let's consider the followers of Moses and the followers of Jesus. Moses had a lot of followers. There were over a million people that left Egypt and they saw 
some amazing things. <laughs> they saw in one night the people of Egypt who were saying, no, you can't go, you can't leave. In one night, the people were going, we want you to leave, and oh, by the way, take any of our stuff that you need for the journey. And they took it and they walked out of Egypt. And then they saw the sea parted and they walked across on dry land. Then they saw the most powerful army in the world enter into that dry land and then get destroyed. They saw God provide for them. They saw God provide food. They saw God provide a pillar of fire and a cloud to guide them and to protect them. They saw God do amazing, amazing things. And they were a rebellious, ungrateful people who complained constantly. And that's where Psalm 95 comes in. That's the Psalm that the writer of Hebrews will now quote here in the second half. Beginning at verse seven, he says, therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, just as a, a quick aside, we could do a whole sermon on this, but I'll take one sentence. As the Holy Spirit says, he is equating the Psalm written by the Holy Spirit. He's saying scripture is written by God. Back to our sermon. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion on the day of testing in the wilderness where, the, where your fathers put me to the test and saw my works for 40 years. Therefore, I was provoked with that generation and said they always go astray in their heart. They have not known my ways. They shall never enter into my rest. Remember a minute ago, I said that the second time that the people complained about water, Moses takes the staff, water gushes out. Moses is punished for that. Psalm 95 is recounting the first time that happened. The first time that happened, the people are beginning to grumble and complain. Why did you bring, I don't know if they sounded that whiny. Why did you bring us out here to die of thirst? And then they said something remarkable we would rather go back. We'd rather go back and live in slavery than to live out here as followers of God. And they quarreled with God and the place was called Masa and Mirabah. You, your translations of, of Psalm 95 there, it might have those words and those words mean where they quarreled, quarreled with God. And so the writer of Hebrews is going to say is, consider the followers of, of Moses. Do you know what their problem was? They didn't believe. Look down at verse 19. <clears throat> he says, so we see they were unable to enter because of unbelief. And in verse 12, he says, take care, brothers and sisters, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God. It's almost, I think, he's concluding his argument from chapters one and chapter two, that Jesus is better than an angel, he's better than man, he's better than Moses, and if we reject any of that, here's the core of what that is, it actually is unbelief. It's unbelief. What the people who followed after Moses, as they grumbled, as they whined, as they saw God do incredible things, actually their hearts did not believe. And so he is warning the church that he is writing to, and he is through the spirit warning us that if we wanna be tempted to water down Jesus, if we want to be tempted to say, well, here's someone great, I'm going to emulate them, rather than trusting in him, in, in Jesus, by grace, through faith, and having our salvation found in him alone, the writer of Hebrews says, you know, what the heart of all of this is? It's actually you don't believe. You don't believe fully and finally and completely in the gospel. A lot of people will, and maybe as you've read Hebrews, will think, well, this sounds like he's saying that you can lose your salvation. But that's not what he's saying. He's saying that you never had salvation to begin with. 
that you never really believed. It's, it reminds me of, of the parable of the sower. I think it's in Mark chapter four. It's, it might be in another uh, couple of the gospels as well, where Jesus says, here's what the kingdom of God is like, where the seed is spread. It's spread widely. It goes everywhere. Some of it falls on the path. Some of that on the path, it gets trampled and it never grows. Some of it falls over to the side of the path and it begins to grow. And as it grows, the weeds and stuff begin to choke it out and then it dies away. Others goes on the field where it grows and it produces a harvest. And the disciples are, they come to Jesus because that was the first parable that he taught and was just like, what are you talking about? That was the weirdest story ever. You're losing it, Jesus. He said, let me tell you what that story is about. The gospel goes out, it's spread out. And some people that hear it, it never even takes, takes any kind of growth. People just walk on it and they just walk on by, they never believe. Others, it begins to grow a little bit. They begin to ask questions and begin to think, but when the persecution comes or when it gets hard, they just give up and they never fully or really believed. And so the writer of Hebrews says, be careful. Be careful that you actually really believe, that you really believe in the gospel. And to do that, he says this in verse 13, exhort one another every day, as long as it's called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin, for we have come to share in Christ if indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end. The original confidence is the hope of the gospel, is that we are saved not by our works, but by the works of Jesus. That is the confidence that we have, that it is by grace through faith and not of ourselves, that it is all of what God has done for us in Christ, and not to dilute it, not to say, we'll add... Uh, to, to, tone down Jesus and just say he's an angel or just say, like, just be like Jesus is enough. No, he says, the original confidence that we have in knowing the gospel and exhort one another every day as long as it's called today. Tell each other that every day as long as it's called today. I, I have a friend who as has been, as by his own admission, he's an addict. He has a substance abuse addiction. And, and he can tell you, I have been sober for 29 years, 11 months, and 15 days. He knows the exact number of days. He counts them. He said, I've, I've, I haven't fallen off the wagon in that long. And you know why? Why? I've gone through lots of meetings and AA. They're all incredibly helpful and wonderful programs. But I have a friend who has called me every day for 25 years. And he says the same thing every day. Sobriety is better. You don't want to be like that. <laughs> he said, it gets me through the hard days. And sometimes I say, hey, pal, can you call me? Can you call me at 8 o'clock tonight when it's going to be really rough? And he does. And the writer of Hebrews says, let's do that with the gospel. Let's do that with the gospel. Because some of us might want to give up. Some of us might be tempted to, to put our trust in our own works. Some of us might be tempted to, to put others on, on a pedestal that they don't deserve where only Jesus needs to be. And to say, as long as it's called today, every day, just text somebody, call somebody. As you walk your dog by somebody's house, that you know, you're in the same church, just go by their house and just, your neighbors will think they're crazy. That's okay, I think. They'll think you're crazy. And just yell out to them, Jesus is better. Call them, text them that. You don't have to text, I'm a, like, Pastor Drew, I'm going to make a prediction. Like by two o'clock, I'll have 20 texts that will tell me. That you, don't, I'll let you, other people, tell other people. Don't tell me because I don't want everybody telling me. Only one of you can. I'll let you know who you are. <laughs> text to other people. 
Tell them before you leave today, when we sing the final song in a minute and I do the benediction, look to the person behind you and just look them in the eye and say, Jesus is better. Hold fast to our original hope. Because my friends, we don't know what one another are going through. We don't know by and large what we're dealing with, what we, what we struggle with. And we need that encouragement. I need that encouragement. And I'm not the only one. We all are. To point us to Jesus. Moses was faithful in all God's house as a servant to testify to the things that were to be spoken later. We are called and invited to share with one another and to point one another. Just as I said, Moses, he was here and he was pointing this way. So are you. And if we're afraid to do that, if we grumble, if we complain, if we look at all the things that God has given us and we go, God, I just want something more. I want this, I want it better. The writer of Hebrews, as he twists his finger in us goes, maybe it's unbelief. It's a hard question for us to wrestle with, that I've wrestled with, that I invite you to wrestle with as we come to that place. My friends, let's encourage one another in the gospel. Let me pray for us. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the fact that it uh, goes deep sometimes. It, it challenges our unbelief. It challenges our, uh, our bitterness, our complaining, our struggles, uh, and where we have our, our sights set. Uh, so Lord, I pray that you would help us, help us all to see and to know that Jesus is indeed better, to hold fast to him, Lord, I, I don't know all that my friends here are, are struggling with and going through, even this morning, even what's going on in their hearts right now. Lord, if there are any that are here that don't believe, Lord, would you open up the beauty of the gospel to them? Would they know today that they can be saved of their sin and they can receive your righteousness? And Father, for those that are part of that house, that you are building, may we look to the builder of it, not to those who, who, who work and who do the, the things of the ministry, but that we would ultimately be pointed to you as the one who builds. And may we rejoice that we are counted as believers in Christ as that house. What an amazing thing. Lord, help us to live in light of that. Help us as we're gonna think about next week to rest to rest and to lay down from our works and to rest in the finished work of Christ. In Jesus' name, amen.